In this video, we're going to extend what we know about probability in order to represent situations um, where maybe an event is defined in a little bit more complicated manner. So specifically, we're going to talk about an event not occurring, so one event occurring versus that event not occurring, or the possibility that one or another event can occur. So if you recall, we defined an event as just a particular outcome or a series of outcomes resulting from some type of experiment or some type of sequence of actions. So now we're talking about particular outcomes not occurring or one or another outcome occurring, potentially um, based on executing our, um, our experiment. And then we're also going to talk about odds, which are closely related to these particular concepts. So let's start with the probability of an event not occurring. So we're going to call this the complement of an event. So the complement of an event is the set of all outcomes in the sample space, so in the set of all possible outcomes that are not outcomes representative of the event. So either a particular outcome is reached or the opposite, all the other outcomes are possibilities. That would be defined as the complement. So the complement is all the outcomes not represented in the event. So everything in the sample space that's not part of the particular event in question. So suppose we know the probability of our given event and we're interested in the probability of that event not occurring. The probability that an event will not occur, so the probability of not E, is going to be 1 minus the probability that E does occur. So the probability that E doesn't occur is 1 minus the probability that it does occur. Now since we know that sets are very heavily involved in these situations, the sample space is a set, an event is a subset of that sample space, we can also define things in terms of set notation. So this term complement is not actually new. We use this term when we were talking about sets. We define the complement of a set as everything in the universal set except what's in the particular set in question. And the notation for that was the prime notation, which looks like an apostrophe. So E prime is the complement of the event E. So if we were to use set notation, rather than having to use the word not, we would say the probability of E prime is going to be 1 minus the probability of E. So the probability that E doesn't occur is 1 minus the probability that E does occur. So let's look at a couple examples. So suppose you're dealt one card from a standard 52 card deck. We want to find the probability that you are not dealt a queen. So the probability that you are not dealt a queen is going to be 1 minus the probability that you are dealt a queen. So you could actually take a couple different approaches to solving a problem like this. We're going to use this idea of the complement and the formula that results from finding the probability of a complement. But what would your other option be? Well, you would have to think about all the different outcomes that represent not dealing a queen. So if you don't deal a queen, well, what might you have dealt? Well, you could deal any other card in the deck except a queen. Why would thinking of probability in terms of that be potentially a little more complicated? Well, you have to determine all the different other outcomes that represent not dealing a queen. That may require a good deal of counting. So suppose you don't deal a queen, what could you deal? Well, you could deal a king, you could deal an ace, you could deal a jack, you could deal every other card in the deck except a queen. So you'd have to determine all those different possibilities. Alternatively, finding the probability that we do deal a queen is actually pretty straightforward. We're looking at one small subset, one small event, a small subset of our sample space. Think of the sample space as all the 52 cards. So it's one card from that deck. So the sample space is the space consisting of our 52 cards. So the probability that we deal a queen is how many ways we can deal a queen divided by how many elements there are in the sample space. So there are five, four ways, excuse me, to deal a queen out of the 52 possible outcomes dealing one card from a 52 card deck. And if we reduce that, that's going to be one over 13. So that's the probability that we do deal a queen. Well, the question we're trying to answer is what is the probability that we don't deal a queen? In other words, what's the probability of the complement of this event that we're calling Q? So we're looking for the probability of Q prime defined as the complement of Q. 
it's defined as one minus the probability that our event did occur. So in this case, it's going to be one minus one over 13, which is the probability that our event did occur. Now this is gonna require you to take a whole number and subtract a fraction. And there are techniques for doing that, algebraically doing it without a calculator. You have to find a common denominator and then subtract that way. Or if you wanna do it in the scientific calculator, here's how you do this. So if you have this particular calculator, we're taking one minus a fraction, the fraction we want, here's the fraction button, it's N over D, it's right next to the button that says LN. Our numerator is one, use the arrow to tab over, and then our denominator is 13. So we're taking one minus one over 13. And that gives us the fraction 12 over 13. So if the probability of dealing a queen is one over 13, the probability of not dealing a queen is going to be 12 over 13. So what is that representative of? Well, that's representative of the probability of all the other possible outcomes not representative of dealing a queen. So that would be the probabil probability that we deal anything else in the deck other than dealing a queen. Okay, let's look at another example. The circle graph below shows the time breakdown in minutes for various aspect, aspects of the average 190 minute NFL television broadcast. What is the probability that a minute of the broadcast is not devoted to gameplay or actual football? In other words, imagine taking your average 190 minute broadcast and randomly picking one minute. So say maybe you recorded the broadcast. You fast forward to one particular minute. So what is the probability that you fast forward to a minute where they're not actually playing? So they're doing something other than playing. Well, what sort of things might they be doing? Well, there is actual game action. So in terms of the graph, game action means they're actually playing. And based on this graph, it's saying actual play constitutes about 11 minutes, just based on the broadcast that we see. What sort of other things may be shown? Well, they be, could be showing replays, shots of other people beside players, so maybe people on the bench, um, the coach who's either really happy or really upset, cheerleaders, anyone else taking shots of anyone else. Shots of players standing around. Wow, 67 minutes out of 190. I think I can believe that, oddly enough. And then also, the broadcast consists of commercials. So a large fraction of the broadcast is commercials in order to, of course, pay for the broadcast. So all of these different things may be seen in 190 minutes. Our question is, how likely is it, if you randomly pick a minute of the broadcast, how likely is it that you pick something other than actual game play, which we're calling game action. Well, again, you could take a couple approaches just like you could take a couple approaches to calculating the probability that you're not Delta Queen. What you have to think of, what you have to analyze is how many different ways could you have an outcome that's not representative of game action? Well, you could have replays, you could have commercials, shots of players standing around or shots of other people there at the game. So you could calculate the probability of all of those things happening, or you use the complement formula. So the probability of not finding a particular minute representative of gameplay is one minus the probability that you do fast forward to a minute representative of gameplay. Well, what's the probability that you pick a particular minute representative of gameplay? Well, out of 190 minutes, this particular graph says on average 11 minutes are actually representative of the players um, do, running a play, something like that. So the probability that you're looking at actual football, I have F um, representative of football, the probability that you actually pick a minute that's representative of football, well, how many different ways could you do that? Well, there's 11 minutes that you could choose from out of the 190 total minutes representative of the whole broadcast. So the probability that you actually choose a minute that represents football, they're actually running a play, is going to be 11 out of 190. So from that, we wanna answer the question, if this is the probability that you do pick a minute that's representative of actual football, what's the probability that you pick a minute that's not representative of action, action um, Actual, actual football, excuse me. Um, so the complement of this event. So F versus F prime. 
So the probability of f prime is gonna be one minus the probability of f, the probability that you are actually watching um, some instance of actual gameplay. So again, we can um, figure out what that's going to be in the scientific calculator. So one minus our fraction, which is 11 over 190. And that's gonna be 179 over 190. Now, if we wanna know what this actually represents maybe a little bit more meaningfully as a decimal, we could take 179 and divide it by 190, and that's going to give us that particular decimal. So roughly 0 0.94. Another way to think of that is 94%. So how would we interpret that? Well, if you're randomly picking a minute of the game, what that means is 94% of the time, you're gonna pick a minute that's not actually representative of football, that's representative of something else in the broadcast. So 11 out of 190, so about 6% of the time, you'd pick actual football, since the probability of picking a minute that's actual football is 11 out of 190, or about 0 0.06. The rest of the time, which is about 94% of the time, you pick um, a minute that's not representative of actual football. So that's a couple examples of how you directly use the complement formula. Now there are actually other ways to use the complement formula. So now we're gonna talk about how we would kind of use the formula backwards. So in some instances, the probability of an event's complement is easier to calculate than the probability of the event. So if we were to take the complement formula and then rearrange it, we can use the formula in a couple different ways. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's look at the formula. So the probability of the event's complement is one minus the probability of the event. What if we then wanted to solve for just the probability of the event in terms of the event's complement? Well, for instance, we could add this negative term and move it over, and then we could subtract this term and move it over. So if the probability of an event's complement is one minus the probability of the event, we can also say that the probability of an event is one minus the probability of the complement. So they're related in the same way. Sometimes based on how an event is defined, it's easier to find the probability of that event's complement. And then we can just use the complement formula, but we're using it backwards, we're working backwards. So what would that look like? Well, here's an example. So the circle graph below shows the distribution by age group of the 214 million drivers in the United States with numbers rounded to the nearest million. If one driver is randomly selected from this population, find the probability that the person is less than 80 years old. Okay, and we want to write our probability as a simplified fraction. So the person is less than 80 years old. Well, based on this distribution, what could that mean if they're less than 80 years old? Well, they could be less than 19, so they could be a new driver. They could be 20 to 29, they could be 30 to 39, they could be anyone all the way up to the group that's 70 to 79. That represents a large portion of the chart. And notice that describing the event that the person is less than 80 years old actually represents a bunch of different outcomes. It doesn't just mean we have one group that's less than 80. We have a bunch of different groups that would be considered less than 80. So directly solving for the probability that someone is less than 80 years old involves us calculating all these different combos and then combining those probabilities. An alternative to this is if we can determine what the complement of this event is, Potentially the complement is easier to find the probability for, and then we can use this probability formula, just use that complement formula backwards. So suppose a person is less than 80 years old. Well, what would the opposite of that be? Think of the complement as the opposite. Well, if you're not less than 80 years old, then you're at least 80 years old, so you're greater than or equal to 80. So the complement of being less than 80 is being greater than or equal to 80. That would be the event representative of the complement of being less than 80 years old. Well, why does that help us? Well, look at our chart. Greater than or equal to 80 is one segment in the chart. That's the smallest segment and all the other 
wedges in the chart are actually representative of the event, whereas only one wedge is representative of the event's complement of being greater than or equal to 80. So the probability of being greater than or equal to 80 is pretty easy to solve for because there's only one wedge in the chart representative of someone being greater than or equal to 80. Well, how many ways can we choose someone that's greater than or equal to 80? Well, there's 8 million people who are greater than or equal to 80 out of the 214 million represented in the whole chart. So we could say 8 million over 214 million, or because it's all apples to apples, it's all millions, we can also just say 8 over 214, which reduces to 4 over 1 over 7. Now that's not the answer to the question. That's a step in finding that answer. So this is the probability that we find someone that's at least 80 years old. Well, our question is what's the probability that we pick someone who's less than 80, 80 years old? In other words, this is the complement of that event. Now we find, want to find the probability of the actual event. Well, the probability of the actual event is going to be 1 minus the probability of the complement. So the probability that you pick someone who's less than 80 is 1 minus the probability that you pick someone who's at least 80, which is 4 over 107. So whatever number this is, this is our actual probability. So 1 minus 4 over 107 comes out to 103 over 107. So that's going to be the probability of this particular event picking someone that's less than 80 years old. Now one thing I want to look at here that's kind of special, what happens if you take the probability of one particular event and the probability of the complement, these two are complementary, what happens if you take those two probabilities and add them together? So in other words, take 4 over 107 plus 103 over 107. Well that adds up to 1. What about the other one we looked at with football, okay? The probability that we choose a minute of football is 11 over 190. The probability that we don't choose a minute of football is 179 over 190. What happens if we add those two together? So 11 over 190 plus 179 over 190. Well, that also adds up to one. Not a coincidence, anytime you take the, um, the probability of a particular event, the probability of the complement, they always add up directly to one every single time if you do the calculations correctly. Why is that? Well, if you think of an event as being a subset of the sample space, what it's doing is it's taking the sample space and it's breaking it up into pieces. The event represents some combination of outcomes in the sample space, and the complement just represents all of the other events in the sample space, all of the other possible outcomes. So if you look at an event, that's one subset. If you look at the complement, that's representative of all the other outcomes of the sample space. So if you put an event and that event's complement together, then that represents the entire sample space. It represents all the possible outcomes. So the probabilities added together represent the probability of choosing something from the whole sample space, which is always going to be one. So one way to check and make sure that your complementary calculations actually make sense is if you take the probability of an event and take the probability of its, con of its complement, those two probabilities should always add up to be one. So that's not officially a guarantee that you did the problem right, but that is a general check to make sure that your answer at least makes sense. So that's going to be the probability of the complement of an event. Now let's talk about the probability of one event occurring or another event occurring. So in order to discuss all the different situations that can arise here, we need to define a particular term. So the term is mutually exclusive. So two events are said to be mutually exclusive if they cannot occur at the same time. In other words, event one versus event two, if there's no outcomes in event one, that also represent outcomes in event two. If there's no way we can have an outcome that represents both events occurring at the same time, then that means our events are mutually exclusive.
So what does that actually mean in terms of the context of events in an actual sample space? Well, we'll look at a couple different examples where we have something that is mutually exclusive and we have something that's not, and hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense. So if A and B are mutually exclusive, in other words, A and B cannot be happening at the same time, then the probability that either A or B will occur, in other words, the probability of A or B is gonna be the probability of A plus, plus the probability of B. Now the word or in set notation is defined as the union operation. So the probability of A union B of this subset and this subset of the sample space, the probability of A union B is gonna be the probability of A plus the probability of B. Only, only if the events are mutually exclusive. If they're not, then we have a different formula. So anytime we're looking at a problem like this, where we're looking at the occurrence of one event or another, keyword is or, not and. If you see the word and, we're talking about a different situation. It's one event or another. We always have to start a problem like that by determining whether or not our events are mutually exclusive. In other words, if one happens, can the other happen at the same time? Is there some combination of outcomes that represents both events happening at the same time? or not. If the case is that not, that both can't happen at the same time, then we know our events are mutually exclusive and we know we're going to use this particular probability formula. So for example, suppose you roll a single six-sided die. What is the probability of getting a four or a five? So one event is rolling a four, the other event is rolling a five. Well imagine rolling one die. If you roll one die one time, can you get a four and a five at the same time? Is there some outcome that represents rolling both a four and a five? Well, the answer is no. If you roll one die, you roll one of six numbers. We're interested in rolling a four or a five, but you can't roll both a four and a five at the same time if you're only rolling one die. So that means these two events in question are mutually exclusive because we can't have both a four and a five at the same time those two events are considered to be mutually exclusive. So that means that the probability of rolling a four or a five is going to be the probability that we roll a four plus the probability that we roll a five, just using this particular formula. Well, what's the probability that we roll a four? Well, how many ways can we roll a four and how many different total outcomes are there? So we're rolling a single six-sided die. So how many outcomes are there? Well, there's six different sides, all labeled differently. So that means there's six possible outcomes to rolling the die. That's going to be our denominator for our probability. Well, how many ways can you roll a four? Well, there's only one four on the die, so there's only one way of rolling a four. So the probability of rolling a four is gonna be one out of six. Same thing for rolling a five. There's six outcomes when you roll. Only one of those outcomes is representative of rolling a five. So that probability is also one out of six. So the probability that we roll a four or a five is the probability that we roll a four, which is one out of six, plus the probability that we roll a five, which is also one out of six. So we're taking the sum of those two probabilities. So one out of six plus one out of six is gonna give us two out of six, which reduces to one third. And again, you can do this one in your calculator if you need. If you struggle with fractions, you're just not confident with that. We're taking one over six plus 1 over 6, which sums to 2 over 6, but your calculator goes ahead and reduces it to 1 out of 3 for you. Okay, so that's one example where we're taking a probability of two events that are mutually exclusive. Okay, let's look at another one. So if one card is randomly selected from a deck of cards, what is the probability of selecting a king or a queen? Now again, we need to determine what are our events and are they mutually exclusive? Well, event number one is selecting a king. So we're dealing one card. It's the probability that we get a king. So the event is getting a king when we deal that one card. The other event is getting a queen. Well, can you deal one card and get both a king and a queen? The answer is no. There aren't any cards in the deck that are a king and a queen at the same time. There's some cards that are kings. There's some cards that are queens, but there aren't any cards that are both at the same time. So that means these two events are going to be mutually exclusive. They can't both occur at the same time. 
So that means the probability of one event or the other is just gonna be the sum of those individual probabilities. Well, what's the probability that we get a king? Well, how many ways are there to get a king dealing from one deck of cards? Well, there's four kings in the deck, so the numerator of our probability is gonna be four. What's the denominator? Well, when we're dealing from that whole deck, there's 52 cards that we could potentially get. So the denominator is gonna be 52. But I wrote one over 13, so why is that? Well, the probability of getting a king is going to be four out of 52. If I just type that in and then press enter, it reduces that fraction for me. So the reduced probability of getting a king is gonna be one out of 13. Well, what about getting a queen? Well, how many queens are there in the deck? There's four. Just like there's four kings, there's also four queens out of the 52 cards. So it's gonna be the same probability that we get a queen because there's the same number of each of these types of cards in the deck. So the probability that we get a king or a queen is gonna be one out of 13 plus one out of 13, which is two out of 13. So that's gonna be the probability that we get one or the other. So both of these examples we looked at, we had events that were mutually exclusive. There's no way that one and the other can happen at the same time. If one happens, then we know for sure the other hasn't, so those events are mutually exclusive. Now what if the events are not mutually exclusive? So it's possible that we can define some events where based on how they're defined, one and the other can be occurring at the same time. In other words, there, there's some possible outcomes in the sample space that represent both events as defined. If that's the case, then we have a similar probability formula with one particular adjustment to it. So if you think back to when we talked about counting what's in a union, we talked about how to do that. We said we can't just calculate what's in one set and add it to what's in the other because that doesn't take into account what's going on with the overlap. If there's some overlap between the two events, then counting what's in one set and just adding on what's in the other double counts the overlap. It double counts the elements they have in common. And so we ended up subtracting that in order to avoid that double count. The exact same thing happens here. So if we're looking at a combination of events, a combination of outcomes, where there's potentially some outcomes representative of both events, think of those like the intersection. If we're talking about a union, two sets put together, think about picturely, um, picture of a diagram visually, something like that. There's potentially a region where our two circles overlap. We can't double count what's in that region. We only count it one time. That's what's happening here. So if A and B are not mutually exclusive, then the probability of A or B is still gonna be the probability of each added together, but that double counts the events or the outcomes representative of A and B at the same time. Those events are calculated in twice. So we have to subtract out that probability that both occurred at the same time so that we only count it the one time and then don't count it the second time. And then of course, in terms of set notation, the probability of A union B is gonna be the probability of A, press the probability of B, minus the probability of A intersect B. So A intersect B represents those combinations of outcomes that mean that the situation is not mutually exclusive. Those are the outcomes that represent both events occurring at the same time. Okay, so let's look at a couple examples. So in a group of 50 students, 23 take math, 11 take psychology, and seven take both math and psychology. If one student is selected at random, find the probability that the student takes math or psychology. So one event in this case is the student takes math, one event is the student takes psychology. Now, are these events mutually exclusive? In other words, if we pick a student who takes math, does that automatically mean that that student doesn't take psychology? Well, in this case, the answer is no. In this case, the answer is we can pick someone who takes both math and psychology. There's seven students who do. So these two events are not mutually exclusive. It's possible that event A and event B occur at the same time. It's possible that if you pick one person at random, you picked someone who takes both math and psychology. So because there is some overlap in how these two events are defined, it's possible that both could occur at the same time, 
that means these events are not mutually exclusive and it means we have to use the adjusted um, formula for the probability of the union. So the probability that we choose someone taking math or we choose someone taking psychology is the sum of the individual probabilities. But again, keep in mind that double counts everyone who takes both. So any student who takes both math and psychology is counted here. Any student who takes both math and psychology is counted here. So we're double counting those people rather than just counting them the one time that they contribute towards the total. So we have to subtract that single count in order to make sure that we're only counting them one time. So let's look at each of these probabilities. So the probability that we choose someone taking math. Well, there's 23 to choose from out of the 50 total. So the probability that we choose someone that takes math is gonna be 23 out of 50. Now, what about the probability that someone's taking psychology? Well, there's 11 taking psychology out of the 50 total. So that's gonna be 11 out of 50. Now we know that seven are taking both. So those seven people are included in the total of 23 and in the total of 11. So we've counted those seven people as part of the 23 and part of the 11. So we have to subtract the probability that someone takes both. Well, how many ways can we pick someone who takes both? Well, there's seven to choose from. So there's seven ways to choose someone that takes both math and psychology. So the probability that both events occurred at the same time is gonna be seven out of 50. So we subtract that probability. So 23 out of 50 plus 11 out of 50 minus seven out of 50 is gonna be 27 out of 50. So that's gonna be the probability that we choose someone taking math or psychology. Now remember when we use the word or in math, we do mean that both is a possibility. So we talked about exclusive versus inclusive or. Exclusive or means one or the other, but not both. So when we use the term or in just plain speech, in a lot of situations we mean one or the other, but not both. I can go here or I can go there, but I can't go to both places at the same time. When we're talking about or in math, specifically in the context of sets, we mean one or the other and possibly both. So I could take one friend with me or I could take another friend with me or maybe I could take both friends with me at the same time. It's that kind of situation. So keep in mind that's what we're talking about here. That's the reason why we're deducting that overlap because there is overlap because or means we're considering the possibility that both occur at the same time. Let's look at another example where the events are not mutually exclusive. So we've got a spinner, so we have eight equally sized regions. In other words, the likelihood of landing on any one versus any other is the same because they're all the same size. So if the pointer lands on a borderline, you'll spin again. We wanna find the probability that the pointer stops on an even number or a number greater than five. So those are gonna be the two events. Probability of getting an even number, the probability of getting a number greater than five. Okay, are these events mutually exclusive? In other words, if we get an even number, is it possible to get a number greater than five? Well, which events represent getting an even number? We could land on a two, a four, a six, or an eight. Which events represent getting a number greater than five? Well, we could land a six, a seven, or an eight. Notice that there's some overlap there. So getting an even number and getting a number greater than five the outcomes of landing on eight and six are actually included in both of those events. So six and eight are both numbers that are even, and they're also numbers that are greater than five. So that means these two events are not mutually exclusive. They can actually occur at the same time. So when we calculate the event of one or the other occurring, we have to take into account that those two outcomes, getting a six, getting an eight, are included in the event of getting an even number and in the event of getting a number that's greater than five. So the probability of event one or event two is gonna be the sum of their individual probabilities minus the probability that we choose a number that fits both of these categorizations. Well, what's the probability that we get an even number? Well, how many ways can we get an even number? We could get a two, a four, a six, or an eight, so there's four ways to get an even number. How many total possibilities are there? Well, there's eight regions, they're each equally sized, so they're each equally likely. 
So there's eight equally likely possibilities. So the probability of getting an even number is four out of eight. You don't need to reduce that. You can just wait till the end to reduce it. So if your immediate instinct is to reduce that to one half, that's fine. It's not gonna make it wrong, but there is benefit to leaving it unreduced just for the time being, and I'll show you why. Okay, so we know the probability of getting an even number. What about the probability of getting a number greater than five? Well, how many ways are there to get a number greater than five? We could get a six, we could get a seven, we could get an eight. Why is five not included? Well, we said greater than, not greater than or equal to, or not at least five. At least and greater than or equal to mean we're using that borderline number. In this case, because we want the number to be strictly greater than five, the lowest number we could get is a six and the highest number we could get is an eight. So we have three ways to get a number that's greater than five out of the eight total possibilities. But because these two events are not mutually exclusive, we need to make sure we're not double counting particular outcomes. So the outcome of spinning a six and the outcome of spinning an eight are included in both the event representative of getting an even number and the event representative of getting a number greater than five. So what's the probability that we spin a number that's both even and greater than five? Well, there's two ways to get a number that's both even and greater than five out of the eight possibilities. So that probability is gonna be two out of eight. Now here's why it's potentially a good idea not to reduce your fractions as soon as you write them down. Notice that now we have fractions that all have the same denominator. Why does that help? Well, in order to add and subtract fractions, you have to have the same denominator. So if you were gonna add or subtract these by hand, having a denominator that's the same for each fraction is gonna be your prerequisite because all you're doing now is adding these two numerators and then subtracting this numerator. So by not reducing these until the very end, you actually make your life a little bit easier. So four plus three is gonna be seven, minus two is gonna be five. And notice at the very end, you have a denominator of eight anyway, and it doesn't reduce. So by reducing these fractions, representative of these probabilities, you actually then would add in an additional step, having to get that common denominator, whereas you don't really need it. So in this case, the probability that we get an even number or a number greater than five is going to be five out of eight. Okay, let's look at another situation where events may or may not be mutually exclusive. Sometimes we'll have data in tabular um, format. And so we have to think about where our totals are, what the table means. So in this case, what does this table represent? It shows the marital status of the US population in 2015 with numbers expressed in millions. So let's think about where we find different things in this table. So each of the columns represents a marital status and then each of the rows represents binary gender, so male and female. The bottom row and the far right column represent our totals. So the column represents the totals for each gender based on these categorizations of marital status. And then the totals along the bottom represent the total for each marital status broken down by gender. Notice that if you take the whole row of totals and the whole column of totals, each of those subtotals adds up to 254. So that 254 down there, that's the grand total of everyone here in the table. That means that if we're going category by category, we're looking out at a total of 254 people. So it's 254 in total that have, been, that have then been categorized based on their gender and based on their marital status. Okay, so now that we know what the table means, let's see what we're being asked. So if one person is randomly selected from the population represented, we wanna find each of the probabilities and we're going to write it as a simplified fraction and as decimals rounded to the nearest hundredth if we do in fact need to round. Okay, so the first event is the probability that the person is divorced or male. So the probability that we pick someone who's divorced or we pick someone who is male. Now, as soon as I see that word or, divorced or male, I'm talking about one event, the event that we pick someone who's divorced, 
and then another event, the event that we pick someone who is male, one or the other. So as soon as I see the word or, I have to ask myself, are these events mutually exclusive? In other words, if we pick someone who's divorced, is it possible or is it impossible to pick someone who's male? Well, we know we can definitely pick someone who's divorced who's also male. So it's possible that we pick a person that fits under both of those categories at the same time. That means these events are not mutually exclusive. It means they can both happen at the same time. That means we need to use the formula that accounts for the fact that those can both happen at the same time. So the probability that we pick a divorcee or someone who's male is going to be the probability of each of the events which double counts those who fall into both categories. So then we subtract the probability of that overlap so that we only count it the one time and then deduct it the second time we counted it. Well, what's the probability that we pick someone who's divorced? Well, again, go back to the definition for probability. It's how many ways we get this outcome based on picking a divorcee out of how many total options we have to pick from. Well, how many divorcees do we have to choose from? Well, we have 26 in total. So in, ter in terms of choosing someone who's divorced, there's 26 ways to choose someone who's divorced out of 254 choices in total. So again, remember these technically are millions, but because they're all in millions, we can just say 26 and 254. So the probability that we pick someone who's divorced is gonna be 26 out of 254. Now, what about the probability that we pick someone who is male? Well, how many options do we have for choosing someone who's male? We have 123 options. So 123 ways to choose someone who's male divided by 254 choices in total. Now again, remember, we've double counted people who are both male, they fit into the male category, and they fit into the divorced category. So we need to subtract the probability that we pick someone who is both divorced and male. Well, how many people are both divorced and male? What we're looking for is the intersection of the male row and the divorced column. So the intersection is represented by 11 or 11 million people. So those 11 people were counted once as being male and twice as being divorced. So we have to deduct one probability based on them being double counted. So the probability that we pick someone who's both divorced and male is going to be 11 because there's 11 ways to pick someone who's both at the same time out of the total of 254 choices. So we have the same denominator, so we can just combine our numerators. So 26 plus 123 minus 11 is gonna be 138 over 254. Notice that both of these are even numbers. So even though they're large, because they're both even numbers, we can at least divide out a common factor of two. So that's gonna take us to 69 out of 127. If we do that division in the calculator, that's gonna be approximately 0 0.54. So that's the approximate probability that we choose someone who is divorced or we choose someone who is male. Now, what about the probability that the person we choose is married or female? Again, are these two events mutually exclusive? In other words, if we pick someone who's married, can we or can we not pick someone who's female? Is it possible that there's anyone that fits into both categories? Well, just like the previous situation, we can definitely pick someone who fits into both categories. There are people who are both married and female at the same time. So these two events are not mutually exclusive. So we wanna look at the probability of one or the other, so married or female. So P of M plus P of F minus P of both events occurring at the same time. In other words, that combination of people that actually were counted twice in each of those probabilities. So the probability that we pick someone who is married, well, how many ways are there to choose someone who's married? There's 133 married people out of the 254. So the probability that we pick someone who's married is 133 out of 254. What's the probability that we pick someone who's female? Well, there are 131 females out of the 254. So 131 out of 254. That double counts people who are both married and female. 
So we need to subtract that group of people that were double counted. So what's the probability that we pick someone who's both married and female? Well, married and female, there are 67 people that are both married and female at the same time. So the probability that we choose someone who fits into both categories is gonna be 67 out of the total of 254. So we have the same denominator, combine our numerators, that gives us 197 out of 254, which does not reduce. That's gonna be approximately 0 0.78. So this particular event, this particular event, choosing someone who's married or female, is substantially more likely than choosing someone who is divorced or male because the probability is higher. That's because there are more people who are married or female than there are people who are divorced or male. This category represents more individuals in the table. Now let's look at one last example here. So what's the probability that we choose a person who is married or divorced? So are these particular events mutually exclusive? In other words, if we pick someone who's married, can we also be picking someone who's divorced at the same time? Now we're gonna assume it's your current status. So either you're currently married or you're currently divorced, not you were divorced and then you got remarried. Remarried would be considered married. So that means you cannot pick someone who's both married right now and divorced right now. So these two events are considered to be mutually exclusive. Both cannot occur at the same time. So that means the probability that we pick someone who's married or divorced is going to be the sum of those individual probabilities. So how many ways do we have to pick someone who is married? Well, there's 133 married people out of the 254. So 133 out of 254. And then in terms of divorced, there are 26 people out of 254. So 26 out of 254. Same denominator, add our numerators. That's going to be 159 out of 254, which does not reduce, and it approximates to 0 0.63. So there are different situations where we have to consider whether or not events may be mutually exclusive or not. Ultimately, it comes down to could both events in question happen at the same time? Are there any outcomes that represent event one being true? or characteristic one being true, and then also the second event or characteristic being satisfied as well. If the answer is no, they can't both occur at the same time, then our events are gonna be mutually exclusive. If the answer is yes, they can occur at the same time, then our events are not mutually exclusive and we have to adjust the probability to account for anyone who fits into both categories at the same time. Okay, so let's wrap up with a quick discussion of odds. So odds are used to compare the likelihood of an event occurring to the likelihood that the event does not occur. So in a lot of times you'll see odds in terms of races, something like that. Suppose it's a horse race. Odds in favor of one particular horse winning versus the odds of that horse not winning. So when we look at odds, odds are not probabilities. They are comparisons of probabilities. And we have two versions of calculating odds. So we can calculate the odds in favor of an event happening, and then we can also calculate the odds against an event happening. So if we know the probability of an event occurring, and we also know the probability that it does not occur, then we can define the odds in either situation. So the odds in favor of the event occurring are defined as the probability of the event divided by the probability of the complement of the event. So what's the probability the event occurs? Divided by the probability that the event does not occur. We know how to calculate that based on our discussion of the complement. Now we're just taking a comparison, specifically a ratio of those two probabilities. Now what about the odds against an event? That's gonna be the reciprocal of the first set of odds. So the odds against an event are gonna be the probability that the event does not occur divided by the probability that it does. So based on in favor or against, that tells you what the numerator of your odds are gonna be. So the numerator is gonna be the probability in favor. And then in the case of odds against, it's gonna be the probability of the complement of the event not occurring. And there are different ways to represent odds in terms of notation. We're just going to use a fraction 
but sometimes you can word, use the word two, so maybe 12 to one, something like that. You can also use a colon, so 12 colon one, remember the colon is the double dots. That's also a notation for odds, but again, we're just gonna use a fraction because fractions allow us to manipulate things algebraically. So those are gonna be the easiest things to get just based on us doing the algebra to calculate odds. Okay, so let's look at an example. So you roll a single six-sided die, find the odds in favor of rolling a two and the odds against rolling a two. In either case, we need probabilities. So we need the probability of the event in question, and then we also need the probability of its complement. So our event is the event that we roll a two based on rolling a single six-sided die. Well, how many ways are there to roll a two? If we only roll one die, there's only one way to get a two out of these six different possibilities. So the probability of rolling a two is gonna be one out of six. Now, in order to calculate odds, we also need the probability of the complement. So what's the probability that we don't roll a two? Well, we can either calculate it directly or we can use the formula for the complement. And let's do that here. So the probability that we don't roll a two is gonna be one minus the probability that we do. Well, the probability that we do is one out of six. So one minus one out of six comes out to five out of six. So this is the probability that the event does happen. This is the probability that the event doesn't happen. So we want the odds in favor of this event and we want the odds against the event. So the odds in favor, that's going to be the probability that the event does happen divided by the probability that it doesn't happen. Now this is called a complex fraction. So this is two fractions inside of a fraction. Don't be alarmed. There's a quick way to simplify this. Simplifying this though in the easy way requires that you didn't reduce these particular probabilities if they could reduce. In other words, you wanna make sure your two probabilities have the same denominator. That's what you're looking for. So if reducing means you change the denominators, you don't wanna reduce. You wanna have the same denominator because here's the shortcut. If you have two fractions, one divided by another, and the denominators are the same, then if we were to simplify this using actual sort of expanded algebra, the two matching denominators are actually gonna cancel, and then one just becomes our numerator, and five becomes our denominator. So the odds in favor are gonna be one over five. It's gonna be one to five. We can verify that that does happen with a calculator, so let's do that the one time. So we have a complex fraction. We have one, let's see, one out of six, and then we're dividing that by five out of six. And notice, sure enough, it comes out to one fifth, which were the odds we wanted. So as long as we have two fractions, one divided by another, and they have a matching denominator, those denominators are gonna cancel, and we're just left with our first numerator and then our second numerator as our denominator. Now, once we have the odds in favor of an event, the odds against are really, really quick to calculate. All we have to do is take the reciprocal of the likelihood of the actual event occurring, the odds in favor of the event. So if the odds in favor are one out of five, the odds against are gonna be five out of one. Now normally we don't write something like this that looks improper. Normally when we have a denominator of one, we don't write it. But when we're talking about something like odds, it is a true comparison between two numbers. So we do wanna write it as five over one and not just reduce it to five. So we could also write five to one using the word two. We could write five colon one. All of those would be considered correct ways to write the odds. Okay, let's look at another example. So you're dealt one card from a 52 card deck. Find the odds in favor of getting a red queen and the odds against getting a red queen. Okay, so let's look at the probability of the actual event. So remember, we have to compare the probability that the event does occur and the probability that it doesn't occur. So the event in question is the event that we deal one card and get a red queen specifically. Well, how many ways are there to get a red queen? Well, there's four queens in the deck and the red queens are gonna be the queen of hearts and the queen of diamonds. So there's two ways to get a red queen if we deal one card. So there's two outcomes in the event divided by the 52 that are total impossible. 
And I went ahead and reduced this one because I happen to know that the complementary event is also gonna reduce. But alternatively, you just leave your probability like this and you can worry about reducing later. So that's the probability that our event does occur. Now, what about the probability of the complement? We can either calculate directly or we use the complement formula. So let's do that just because it means we don't have to worry about defining what the complement actually represents in this situation. So it's gonna be one minus two out of 52 or one out of 26, which ends up giving us 25 out of 26. So notice that both of the probabilities fully reduced have a denominator of 26. That means calculating the odds is gonna be pretty straightforward. So the odds in favor of this event, it's gonna be the probability that it does occur divided by the probability that the event doesn't occur. We've got those matching denominators, so those are gonna cancel. So we're just left with one in the numerator and 25 in the denominator. So the odds in favor of this event happening are one to 25. Now what about the odds against? We take the reciprocal. So that's gonna be 25 over one. So what do these odds mean? If the odds are less than one, if it's a fraction less than one, it means it's less likely. If it's greater than one, it means it's more likely. So one time out of every 25, we expect this event to occur. 25 times versus one, we expect this event to not occur. So that means the event not occurring is substantially more likely than the event actually occurring. So same thing for the cards and for rolling the two. Okay, let's look at one last example. So the winner of a raffle receive a new SUV. If 500 raffle tickets were sold, and we don't know how much they were sold for, we're not interested in that, but suppose 500 tickets were sold and you purchased 10. What are the odds against you winning the car? Well, we still need the same original components. We still need the probabilities. So what's the event in question here? The event is that we do win. Well, what would that look like in terms of winning? Well, 500 tickets were sold. So just picture 500 tickets being thrown into a bowl. So maybe they took actual tear off tickets. There's the ticket they gave you and then there's the leftover stub that they put into the bowl. So there's 500 stubs in the bowl and then 500 people have some combination of actual tickets themselves. And so they're pulling out of the bowl. So the event is either one of your tickets is drawn, in which case you win, or someone else's ticket is drawn, in which case you lose. So we can define these events as winning and losing. How many ways are there to win? How many ways are there to lose? Well, it's said that you purchased 10 tickets. So 10 different draws out of the bowl represent you actually winning. 10 different ways for you to win because you purchased 10 tickets out of the 500 different draws that are possible. So the probability of you winning is 10 out of 500, which in this case reduces to one out of 50. Now what's the probability that you lose? Well, if any um, ticket other than those 10 is drawn, then you lose, you don't win anything. You just paid money for the tickets, but unfortunately you don't win. So the complementary event is that another ticket is drawn and you lose. So it's gonna be one minus the probability that your tickets are drawn and you win. So one minus one out of 50, which is 49 out of 50. Now we wanted the odds against you winning. So the odds against, that's going to be the probability that you don't win, that the event doesn't happen. The event in question is you winning. So the complement of the event is that you don't win, you lose. So it's going to be the probability that you don't win divided by the probability that you do win. We've got those matching denominators again, so we can cancel those matching denominators and we end up with a numerator of 49 and a denominator of one. So for every 49 times you lose, you expect to win one time. Odds are though, they're only drawing one ticket and there's only one SUV though. So the likelihood of you actually winning is pretty low. So we can represent likelihood in terms of probability or we can represent it in terms of odds, which is then a comparison of one outcome versus the other.